thank you um, to everybody uh, for joining us this evening. I'd like to give a shout out to our uh, amazing chair, uh, Nancy DiNardo, and our amazing uh, vice chair, Eric Russell. And we have our national committee woman, Nancy Wyman, a former chair here with us. Um, so, and our treasurer, Eloisa Melendez, so, uh, yay. And our operations director, uh, Tanaya Baker, who helped uh, put these events together. She's got her Connecticut Dems logo up right now. <laughs> so, um, so it's been great. We have a great team at Connecticut Democrats. And thank you for uh, joining us um, If uh, tonight. Uh, a very good friend of mine who I um, actually met I can't remember the year, at a Women's Caucus event and dragged her into politics at that event at Julie Kushner's house, actually. It was a, um, uh, uh, we had a, a house party uh, with the launch of the Women's Caucus. So it's kind of nice to have Ava here. But um, uh, I, it's my pleasure right now to introduce our Women's Caucus co-chairs who are absolutely amazing women uh, and, and part of the team. Um, Tiffany Teeley, who is um, also the town chair of uh, Hebron, and Kayla Riesco, who is also um, uh, deputy chief of staff for Hartford Mayor Luke Bronin. And, um, these are amazing women leading the way here. Um, so I'm gonna turn it over to them. And also I just wanted to give everybody a heads up that I will put into the chat box. Um, we have some phone banks and some other links of stuff coming up. So I'll put that in there uh, so that you can uh, check that out. And if anybody has any questions uh, for Ava, uh, please do use the chat box. And now I hand it over to you amazing women, yay. Tiffany, did you want to start off saying anything? Uh, I mean, if you want to go ahead, let's go ahead and get started so we can get some good questions in. Cool. So I have the honor of introducing um, our two facilitators of today's event. First of all, shout out to Eva for being here. Um, she's like big sis, and it's always nice to see your face and hear your words of wisdom. So thank you. Um, so our facilitators today um, are the two amazing women, um, Bobby Noel Peterson and Aisha Clark. Um, so just a quick intro on both of them, I'll let them talk about themselves more. Um, Bobby Noel Peterson is the chief of staff to now mayor um, middle, of Middletown, Ben Florsheim, and she was former campaign manager for Ben Florsheim's campaign um, during the primary and during the general. So she's a pretty badass woman um, who, you know, took a lot um, under her wing and really triumphed through um, a primary campaign and a general. So she has a campaign perspective as well as an official side as a chief of staff to a mayor now. Um, and also the amazing Aisha Clark. Aisha is the president of the Board of Education here in Hartford. Um, she is wicked, um, hardworking, and is so smart and passionate about the work that she does in organizing and in community leadership. So I'll let the two of them talk about their work, but just wanted to quickly do a quick intro. And thank you to everyone who's participating today. Awesome, thank you very much, Kayla. I appreciate um, all of that. Today is actually the one year anniversary of our primary victory, so that's pretty exciting. Um, one of the things, social media can be um, a pretty dark place, but it's super nice when, when really great memories pop up. So we had a lot of, you know, there was a lot of, we still have a text chain from our campaign team, and there was a lot of pictures flying back and forth of that whole day, which, um, it was a good day. Uh, it was a good day for Middletown. So yes, like Kayla said, um, I do work for Mayor Florsheim now. Um, did have the opportunity to run his campaign before that. I uh, got to work with Millie Torres Ferguson, who I'm sure many of you know, who is fabulous. Um, I worked with her on the Abrams campaign and really credit her with um, a lot of a lot of the knowledge of how to run a campaign and and you know what is going to work and. Um, She's pretty fabulous. And I think that is around the time that I got to meet Ava and get to know her um, during that very exciting cycle. We had a lot of cool stuff happening at the state level. And um, 
you know, that was really about the time I knew that this is what I wanted to be doing full time. But I know that Ava has a hard stop tonight, so I am going to not talk too much about myself and pass it on. Everyone, um, I am Aisha Clark, and um, I am the Vice President of Operations with Compass Youth Collaborative. And thank you for the introduction, Kayla. Um, I also am the board chair for the City of um, Board of Education for the City of Hartford. Um, additionally, I have served as their regional um, director for Jahan, um, for her la her first term, um, and then I've also served as a treasurer for State Representative Brandon McGee. And so, and I've also volunteered on numerous different campaigns and um, excited to be here and excited to learn more from Ava. Um, I will not take up time as well, and I wanna just dive right in, but I did have the opportunity to meet Ava when I was working for um, Johanna Hayes and very passionate um, young woman who, um, I'm not gonna read her bio, I'm gonna let her talk about herself, but really at that young age of 12 where she just started off volunteering and really understanding the importance of being involved in politics. And so it's exciting to know that young age that she was there and really wanting to hear from you about your transition into work that you're doing now and what is your day-to-day -day life, your day-to-day -day life is like. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn it right over to Ava Bermudez and Zimmerman. Thank you all for having me. So exciting to see so many familiar faces and leaders uh, paving the way for basically stronger women here in Connecticut. I know there's a few men, but this night is about Women's Caucus, so I gotta highlight my chicas. I, I did start at 12. It's, it's not a normal occurrence. I had a philosophy teacher. Um, I went to probably at that time, one of the worst magnet schools or one of the worst middle schools uh, in the nation. And some of you know the story, but Quirk Middle School at that time, it no longer exists, had about 3,000 students in the north end of Hartford. Um, at that time, the north end of Hartford in the 80s and 90s was a hotbed for, a hotbed for um, gangs and violence and drugs. Hartford has come a long way, but I just want to paint the picture of my, my middle school because it takes a lot of courage for teachers, educators, to say, beyond the drugs, beyond the violence, beyond the difficulty these students are, are going through, there is hope in them. So shout out to anyone who's an educator. I am the daughter of two educators. And that, that day in philosophy class where Ms. Sullivan said, there's an election going on. Um, we we wa really want to get you involved as a student. And this was um, this particular season, Al Gore. I know for the older folk there, you're probably laughing and saying, Al Gore, I was like campaigning in Al Gore's uh, election, or I was, I was a staffer. I, I, I was 12, so I am, I'm, I am young. Um, so they painted a picture where this man could create a, in a, an America where we had a focus on environmentalism, a focus on, on my education. And of course, at the, the ripe age of 12, I didn't fully understand the role of a president or the power of a president, but I knew that what my teachers told me seemed it, it seemed exciting and invigorating and something that i wanted to be part of so i was the only volunteer um out of three classes that I invited so over a hundred students who said i'll go with you and i'll pole stand and i'll support you know i'll support this presidential um candidate so night after night during GOTV for about three weeks um a little bit before GOTV and during GOTV. I stood there with the permission of my parents, with my teacher between five and, and 8 p.m. in front of our school, trying to spread the word. And then during election, election night, I poll stood um, with her. Uh, so we've transitioned from trying to pass information and flyers to being on the ground. And that was it. That was my, my real initiation. Um, my parents were very active, active in their, their union, active in educational reform and trying to make sure that we were desegregated. They signed me up um, at the age of one as a chef for colonial plaintiff, but that never felt like it was my own. That felt like that was my parents' path trying to make sure that we had opportunities, my siblings and I and, and other students here in Connecticut. And when I was asked at a very young age, what do you want to do? My answer was always, I want to be a neurologist. I want to be a doctor. I want to be a scientist, always in the, the realm of medicine, medicine and science. So at the young age of 12, to see that there's 
another connection um, to helping people that spearheaded my, my path um, of making that connection that wasn't in science, that wasn't in medicine. Um, at 15, I graduated high school and then by 16, I moved to Brazil. And with Rotary Exchange, that path was still in the science and medical world. And I, I was there giving out syringes and medical supplies to, to students in favelas. And when I came back, I knew that a lot of comparisons with poverty and disparity and, and corruption could be made, unfortunately, with our own territory of the United States, that we were not insulated from poverty here just because we were American. We, we do have politicians that see that they, now more so than ever, especially than when I was 16, there, the fascism wasn't rampant like Trump reality right now, but I was young enough to understand that I could make comparisons despite everyone else telling me, oh, you're going through a third world country, you know, you have to be very careful, you're, you're gonna, you, you can get really hurt, you know, you can get murdered in Sao Paulo, all these horrific stories. And all I saw there when I was trying to build my, my plan through Rotary and try to help people was poverty and people who are warm despite the disparity that they're going through. I was only welcomed in, in homes. I was constantly being bombarded by educational moments of, you know, this is how we do things here. And maybe there's more money there, but we're content with what we have. And I knew that I wanted to do something different. And I knew that that, that path wasn't just in medicine and in science. And I took that, that path in organizing um, from that trip to, to Brazil. And I've been doing it ever since. It's very odd that you have someone who takes uh, their passion and advocacy and makes it into a career. I was very fortunate that I landed um, a job very, very quickly after college working for Congress and Wrangell. I, I did an intern and then um, was asked to stay on. And then from that, it, you know, the world was my oyster when it came to advocacy. Um, at that time with Congressman Rangel, he was the chair of Ways and Means. He, he was in his own right, a very powerful man. And when I decided that I, I, I wanted to move back to Connecticut and reconnect with my family here, I went from campaign to campaign. So I, I don't want to dissuade anyone who wants to become more politically active. Um, I just want to show you that sometimes when you think you have things completely um, organized and completely planned, that might not be how it pans out. Sometimes you have to be willing to take the risk of changing and alternating um, those plans because if you don't, you'd be missing opportunities. Uh, going back to Jacqueline's uh, introduction and starting of our connection and our friendship, I do want to highlight that moment because I was always the person behind the scenes trying to blend into a corner of the wall and be that organizer. I'm like, I, could, I can fix it from within or I can find people who are willing to be the advocate to be the voice. I never saw myself as the voice. I never saw myself as the politician. Um, I went from, from one position in my career in political organizing to labor organizing, and it was always behind the scenes. So that moment in Julie Kushner's house where I was invited to a women's caucus launch for CT Dems, I was that person, and you're gonna laugh at me, those who know me, who was shy, who wasn't interacting with anyone at all. And there were so many powerful women in the room having substantive conversations about changing Connecticut and how women have a voice and a place here. And from that corner, somehow pushing away the chaos, Jacqueline saw me and said, hey, you should be part of the conversation. And I do have to shout it out to Jacqueline because that was the start of me seeing in myself that change could be done from within and it can be done on the sidelines, but it could also be done with you stepping up. Too often we hear that, statistically speaking, we as leaders are only up to the challenge when we're asked multiple times. And we have to stop being that statistic. 
That is not the statistic that we want. We want to be the person who is taking up the challenge and saying, I have value. I have the ability to make change. So with going back to my trajectory and my career and labor organizing and political organizing, it was this constant back and forth of, do I believe in myself or do people believe in me? And then through those years from becoming an organizer to a staff representative, to a councilwoman, to a, you know, a community organizer leading a campaign, to most recently a candidate for lieutenant governor, I realized, wow, I am that change. I could be that change because what I'm saying is not outlandish. What I'm saying has power and people do see leadership in me. So rather than me trying to find that constant confidence, let me just embrace the fact that I have a voice and, and plow ahead. With fast forwarding here some time and going into specifically the Lieutenant Governor race, I, um, I was asked, so I, I got a phone call and someone said initially, we don't have enough people of color running for statewide office. And I wasn't asked to run for Lieutenant Governor. That, that was a path in itself. I was asked to put my name in the hat when it came to the political field statewide. And this was a year prior to the actual convention, the Democratic Convention. My first response was laughter. Laughter for a very long time. It was that kind of like that, that laughter that comes from the bowels of your stomach of you're scared, you're confused, is it a crazy idea? Everything came together with that laughter. And then finally, when I got a grip, I said, why do you think I am a contender for that list that you created of who should put their name in the statewide hat? The, the explanation that this person gave me was looking at what diversity looks like, looking at the women candidates out there, looking at um, people of color who are running, LGBTQ who are running. Unfortunately, even in our state, despite all of the work that we've done, we weren't there yet in cultivating enough candidates to, to show the rainbow that we truly are in our state. And as a Democratic Party, there were people behind the scenes who wanted to make sure that we had the opportunity as voters to exemplify that reality. The end result in the convention, I want to say, is a very proud result. We had a little bit of everything and it really does exemplify who we are as Connecticut Democrats. But at that time, the names that were getting into the race, um, that wasn't the reality. So I took the information, I walked away, I dismissed him. A couple months passed and then the call came again. So I felt like after so many years of me finding that voice and being a council person, putting myself out there, running for office for, for other seats, that I had gotten past the fear of who I am and what I'm capable uh, of doing. And I was just right back to the very beginning of feeling like that meek child, you know, who, who really didn't understand how things can impact them holding that Al Gore sign. I, I really felt right back to being 12 years old. And with the third call, because enough time had passed at that point, it was six months away from the Democratic Convention, I snapped out of it. I went down my own list of potential candidates and the candidates who had put their name um, on, you know, and, and definitely wanted to take the leap of faith to put their names out there. And I said, well, if I'm gonna consider this realistically, then what do I have to add? What value can I add and where can I add it? I'm not gonna be a candidate just for the sake of being a candidate. I'm not gonna be a candidate because I want this to be a stepping stone to something else. What position can I truly feel like I'm making a difference in? And I created a team. I created a team who didn't think that this idea was ridiculous, who believed in me and saw inspiration in me, and we mapped it out. Like a very good organizer, we, we charted the state basically. And in that charting and talking and seeing where we could do some potential good and what positions are viable. That's how I made the decision to be an exploratory candidate for Secretary of State. 
I knew at that time, I also didn't want to go against an incumbent. And there were some rumors and um, conversation of the Secretary of State, Arch Secretary of State Denise Merrill, not uh, running again. At that point, she was running, but I was holding on to some, some little uh, small piece of hope of who knows what will happen during this election year and where can I make a pivot to be a viable candidate. And even if I do not get far enough in this election, I know that I'd be registering voters. I'd be talking to young women who have never been involved in politics and activating them into my campaign and volunteering for a campaign. I knew that I would be um, growing for the Democrat, Democratic Party past the convention enough that we can have a victory. And I, I had that in mind as an organizer you have to look at what your plan A, your plan B, and the impact that you can make. So that took about two months of even becoming a viable candidate. And when you're talking about statewide and, and you're trying to map out what this looks like, you have to look at how much money are you able to raise um, to participate and make sure that you have flyers, be part of the convention. You have to look at can I get enough support from convention delegates to even be taken seriously and then leave the convention with enough support that I'm, that I'm actually a candidate on the ballot? Um, you also have to look at what it, uh, how, how much reach you have and how much momentum you can build uh, aside from money to then give your, your, your team a victory for the November election or for the primary in that case. So we took, up, took that into account. We had a rally right before convention. We made very creative signs. Um, I wanted to, originally the, the color contrast for our signs was gonna be Black Lives Matters, black and white. Um, and that was also behind the scenes in conversation. And then we pivoted after the convention to what most people are familiar with, with the rainbow colors in honor, in homage to our, my LGBTQ-ness, which now a lot has changed since me being a candidate and me sitting here and talking to you. Um, I'm, I'm married to someone who just came out as trans. Um, I knew that, of course, as a candidate behind the scenes then, but that was not in conversation publicly when I was a candidate, but my friends and, and close loved ones knew that. So those who knew, then now you know, the Rainbow Coalition Colors was not, uh, you know, a mistake or it was purposeful. So moving past the convention, we had enough support in the convention to, to take on a real campaign and grow and make sure that we were activating people. In a very short window, we had thousands and thousands of people who registered to vote for the very first time. Uh, we had um, a, a team of over 200 workers who were working and making phone, you know, phone banking and doing field operations and door knocking. It was quite the sight. We all know the conclusion to the story. I'm, you know, I'm proud to say that we have a wonderful Lieutenant Governor. Uh, she has worked very, very hard as a woman here in politics in Connecticut, and she's still working hard for us. But you have to analyze that the work and trajectory that we each do adds value to making sure that the person coming forward, coming after has that opportunity. You know, there was a time before um, our wonderful Nancy Wyman where you didn't see women getting involved. You didn't see women getting elected. And when you shatter that glass ceiling, when you have that Nancy Wyman coming in, when you have that Hillary running for president, it edges away all of that um, negative energy of you can't do this, you can't do that, and opens the opportunity for, for people like me, people like Kayla, people like Eloisa, people like Bobby to be chief of staff, to be a council person, uh, to, to be the, the front runner when it comes to movement leadership in politics, not only here, but nationwide. Um, I feel like I'm talking a lot, so I do wanna take some questions and, and then go from there, if that's okay. Thank you so much. And so um, I'll start off and then Bobby will ask you another question. So the first question is, how does being a woman actually help you get what you need done? <laughs> um, I would say that working with 
the women's caucus and working with other women in different boards and different capacities that I see a lot more compassion. Um, I see a lot more logic. So maybe one can say it's genetics, one can say it's um, nurture, but there's something about the plight of a woman, you know, the, the, the years of being told that you can't do something, the years of being treated differently, that makes you more resilient. So I would say my resiliency has been my best benefit of being a woman. And maybe that resiliency is not just something that comes um, naturally to a woman. Maybe it's resiliency that's built by anyone who is a minority, but it's definitely something that, that's helped through my career. Thank you. Uh, briefly, I do want to say that that was my favorite campaign sign ever. I loved the rainbow and I'm glad for um, whatever reason that is what we ended up with because I think that it was one of the best I've seen. That and shout out to Justin Farmers, which is my second favorite. Um, who or what inspires you in your work, particularly at a time when the tone in politics can be so raw and divisive? Ah, oh, easy. Shirley Shism. <laughs> Oh man! Oh yeah. Um, the not taking any any um, well, is cursing allowed in this? <laughs> not taking any crap. <laughs> not taking any crap. Uh, her quote embodies her right, saying, "When you don't have a seat at the table, bring a lawn chair." <laughs> That's basically it. Uh, everyone here on this call is an organizer or an advocate in their own right. I know that there's some of you who I do not know and there's people who are gonna be watching this afterwards, but you know what? I'm looking at you, right? Looking at you, whoever's watching this afterwards. If you're watching this, that means that you are more in tune with what's happening in society and what's happening in your state than probably most of your friends. That means that you're taking out the time um, and saying, you know, this election season really does matter. It's a little scary. And I want to learn about how I can make a difference. And Shirley is that. She is that woman who said, I can be president. It doesn't matter if I'm black. It doesn't matter if I'm a woman. Um, I am a leader. I will bring that lawn chair. I will make the change because if you think you can try to, you know, basically put a, a piece of tape on my lips and say, I'm not going to say anything, I'm going to rip it off. I'm gonna rip it off and say whatever I need to say to make sure that we have change. So Shirley's my girl. Thank you, Ava. She's one of my favorite as well. Um, proud sorority, a member of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated for that. So thank you for that. Um, I actually watched the sound bite of her and she talked about how being a woman and the things she had to go through during her time um, in office. So um, share a story when during your political career, being a woman is what made you an outsider. Too often during the campaign, I was compared to Alexandria and, you know, a lot of us are big fans. You know, she speaks up, she, she's out there, she speaks truth and that's great, that's great. But when you're a political candidate and you're not in the same state and you're not the same human, um, it's very frustrating as a woman to be boxed in as every other woman. So if you're a candidate, or if you're politi you know, politically involved, my recommendation is don't, don't do or don't allow yourself to be framed in someone else's narrative. If you are someone who has something to say, stick to what you believe in, find that moral compass, you know, go JFK here. Because when you lose that moral compass, when you lose that narrative, then what are you about? Are you gonna be someone who's easily coerced into corruption? Are you gonna be someone who's gonna be pushed to another side or watered down whatever your political thought is? And if that's a reality, you, you don't have any business running for office. You shouldn't be running for office because your end result is to be rich. You shouldn't be running for office because you're trying to uh, be someone that you're not. And as a woman, I felt too often that I wouldn't have been compared to so many other women if I was a man. That's basically what it comes down to. In my interviews, they spent hours trying to compare me uh, to one, one of the Republican candidates who was also young. 
And they would say, well, you're so much serious. You're so much more serious than her. Um, why aren't you making jokes? You're so young, you, you know, you're both 29. And I said, well, age and being a woman has nothing to do with what you're trying to accomplish. If you have true policy goals that you want to change and you stick to that, going back to the moral compass, then people should take you seriously. If you are creating a narrative that's fake, slowly the constituent, the, vote, the voter, will start peeling those layers and realize that you're someone that isn't true to yourself and maybe you're not worth my time. So rather than wasting people's time, trying to create a facade or trying to mimic someone else, especially when you're in the same arena, then why not be a little bit more original? So again, as a woman, I don't think I would have gone that same, let's build her narrative for her if I was a guy. Thank you. How do you, in your experience, how do you think women lead differently? We're patient. I think I said this before, we're, we're patient. Um, we, we have opportunities for conversation. Um, a lot of the best organizers that I've worked with are women. They take a step back. They, they take an approach more from an angle of a social worker or maybe even an, someone who's analyzing rather than dismissing people's thought or opinion. And that's just a trait that I see more women organizers that I've collaborated with have rather than, than my male counterparts. Thank you so much. And so um, for the, from the previous question, you mentioned the moral compass. So I'm, I'm excited to hear, what do you think would be helpful in women in politics, elected, staff, campaign managers to help empower them? So along with that moral compass, what else do you think will help empower them? Don't put your fellow female down, your fellow woman down. Um, rather than making this a race uh, as to who gets to the top first, make it a coalition. These organizations that we're part of, that we, we're in tune with, and caucuses like this one, gives you an opportunity to realize how much talent is out there and how much strength we have in supporting each other. So when you're in an opportunity of leadership, when you're working and you're, you're trying to grow something, be it a nonprofit, maybe state sector, um, whatever your role is, be aware that you are be inadvertently becoming a leader for someone. You know, some, there's always someone younger than you who's observing. Um, and, and take the opportunity to make that, I, I, I sound like my parents, a teaching moment. <laughs> they were big on the teaching moments, but that's, that's our reality, taking that opportunity to, to teach those around us and not take for granted um, those people who are just supportive. So I want to say um, thank you for being here. It is always a great um, time to get to spend with you and get to hear from you. And um, it always, I feel like moves me back to center and reminds me why we're all doing um, what it is that we do and, and um, inspires and invigorates me. I did have one more thing. Do you have any closing advice for women who would like to take a political path? Yes. Rather than waiting and, you know, don't be me. Don't sleep on it for six months and say, now's my time. I believe myself. Why not just do it? Why not just build a bench? Why not just build a team? Do that kitchen cabinet, have the conversation and don't sell yourself short. So if at any point, and I'm sure people around you have told you, and a lot of, a lot of the callers here um, have been told, you should run for office, you should, you, know, you should give it some thought, then don't double think it and see if you can make it reality because we definitely need you. We need you here, we need you present. And sometimes being an advocate is great, but maybe sometimes you can be an even better politician. <laughs>